Hi everyone, Sifu Sylvain with you once again. Thank you so much for being here. I hope that this finds you in good health and secure. I bring to this, as I've said before, but I haven't said it in a while, close to 50 years of study of the Buddhist teachings and many other teachings which I find are all in support of Shakyamuni's great enlightenment and teachings. So we're going to continue today with an outline of all of the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, trying to avoid the highly infectious uh, translation bias that follows almost anything that we read in English of uh, Buddhist scholarship. It's no longer just a pet peeve of mine. Uh, long ago became something insidious that I'm constantly railing against. And I, I only bring it up again to again remind you to be cautious as you're reading from different sources, consider who the authors are, consider who the organizations behind the authors are, and even more important than all of that, because I'm not playing a blame game, I'm just wanting to identify a pernicious tendency of humans, this idea that we have to word things in a language. It's really condescension for so many brilliant scholars who are not natively English speaking to use terms from English speaking cultures without fully appreciating the meaning of those words, simply for the ruse of appealing to them, it's a disgustingly foolish error. It's just, it's terrible. And what it, what it ends up doing is because those words are so charged, like soul and faith and holy, that you take what is a brilliant, clear, lucid, reasonable, rational analysis of the human condition and how to live a fully manifested life without the foibles of attachments. By using those words, you are inculcating those very diseased attachments into the dialogue of Buddhism. Will you please self-correct? Nichiren Shu, your organization on worldwide propagation, the Overseas Propagation Promotion Association, get your heads out of your butts. Fix this. I will never forget reading this translation of all phenomena are created by the soul. Holy crap, did you just fall off the melon truck? That is the most non-Buddhist thing I've ever read. 
I'm charged up this morning because I was just listening to a speech by uh, Abby Martin on uh, Imperial Empire building and the situation throughout Latin America. Gosh, I'm so in awe of that woman's integrity. She seems like a singular voice where there should be a chorus of intelligentsia, intelligentsia supporting her. And instead, she too is being crushed by the empire. Abby, I have no idea if you'd, listen, you'd ever listen to this podcast or, uh, or in particular this. Maybe somebody will send it to you, but gosh darn it. I respect you and admire you so much. Once again, speaking truth to power. And so I hope you understand that's what I'm doing when I'm railing against these terrible translation biases that just creep in here, either knowingly or unknowingly. It's just so insidious. And I empathize with you guys. That's why I have this channel. Because until you study enough, and I mean by enough, whatever it takes, you may have to study every scrap of paper ever written about Buddhism in order to finally get it. Or you may just read one or two other sutras and start to understand, holy crap. These stupid little words have been totally thwarting my understanding of Buddhism. I don't want that for you. And so please take my words sincerely. All right, let's continue. The last sentence I read was, they believe this is due to the mysterious and divine powers of the Buddhas because they do not understand that the Buddhas naturally possess the nine realms. So we're talking about realms of existence, right? Which are mental constructs and mental experiences. Hmm? To consider this more thoroughly, Nietzsche continues, in the pre-Lotus Sutra, the Buddha appears expediently in front of people to show what it looks like to be a Buddha. This is what being enlightened looks like, but nobody can peer into the mind, right? They can only look at samsaric evidence and the wisdom that shows through. Though ordinary people themselves cannot become Buddhas. This is the pre-Lotus Sutra teachings. Even if ordinary people, eliminating evil passions and keeping away from being in the nine realms, try to become Buddhas, none of them have been able to become a Buddha because there is no Buddha apart from the nine realms. Because there would be no realm of bodhisattvas apart from the human realm, the Buddhas in the Lotus Sutra, who turn their bodies into beings in the ten realms, in the pre-Lotus Sutras, have been called the people who are being taught or Buddhas who teach evil people or virtuous people or non-Buddhists. In reality, evil or virtuous people, non-Buddhists and ignorant people who have blindly believed the expedient teachings to be true realize only in the Lotus Sutra that the teachings they heard previously are all expedients and that they have neither eliminated any delusions in view and thought or darkness of mind, nor attained Buddhahood. This has all been a convenient little school play. They haven't really accomplished those things they think they have. Hinianists. The 3,000 existences contained in one thought Doctrine is omitted. It will be explained in detail in the, f in the future. So for now, he's just taking this initial step to demonstrate pre-Lotus, Lotus. What people thought they were learning, what they were actually not fully appreciating or learning, which is then in the Lotus Sutra. He's just making that transitional He's not 
<clears throat> he's going to dissect the 3,000 realms, believe me. Not yet, though. The Lotus Sutra has two subtleties. Grandmaster Tendai said in his profound meaning of the Lotus Sutra, the Lotus Sutra explains the two subtleties. They are one, relative subtlety, or sodaimo, myo, and two, absolute subtlety. This almost sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? The relative subtlety means to compare the Lotus Sutra with the various sutras expounded in the first four periods of the Flower Garland, Agama, Expanded, and Wisdom, disparaging those various sutras as pre-Lotus. The pre-Lotus Sutras are called for a while, Tobun, for a while. That's their category. Meaning that they only assess their own sutras and therefore are nothing but expedients. On the other hand, the Lotus Sutra is called um, oops, uh, Kasetsu, across a fence. Interesting, the visual, that all the pre-Lotus Sutra teachings are well, we say provisional all the time, but to say they mean for a while, like this will get you by. This will lead you along the way, but it won't get you there. It's just, this will get you by. This level of understanding will get you by. And the lotus is across the fence. Now you're crossing into a different, completely different land, a different place, a different practice. Right? Another way of saying what we've said before, the pre-Lotus Sutra teachings were teachings to others' capacity to elevate them along the path. And then the Lotus Sutra is self-practice. This is Buddha. This is how you do it. To the Buddha's capacity. It's a big leap. It's cross a fence. Meaning that the Lotus Sutra is the supreme teaching revealing the true intent of the Buddha, which he tried to expound through his, throughout his lifetime. The true purpose of the absolute subtlety is to reveal that all the teachings of the Buddha are for the purpose of preaching the Lotus Sutra. This is, what it's, this is the goal. Self-realization. This is the goal. Two things concerning this are mentioned in the Lotus Sutra. One is that provisional teachings are revealed to show the single path to enlightenment. And the other is the revealing of the single path to enlightenment. For example, the open, show, perceive, and enter passage in the second chapter, Expedience, of the Lotus Sutra explaining why Buddhas appeared in this world, or the passage in the same chapter saying, quote, all have attained Buddhahood, end quote, and the fact that each of the 69,384 letters or characters, letters, there's that bias, characters of the Lotus Sutra consisting of eight facels is equipped with subtlety are all, quote, revealing the single path to Buddhahood. So again, taught from the standpoint of attaining, invoking the Buddhahood, which is originally there. The awakening, right? Enlightenment. Those who study Buddhism without knowing the subtlety of the Lotus Sutra will only gain the expedient merits of the pre-Lotus Sutra. So if you're practicing Buddhism, even the Lotus Sutra, with the idea in mind that you're entertaining yourself with some activity like a sport. Although I will say, even in sport, I was a semi-professional cyclist when I was in my teens. When your dedication is fully manifest, you can realize a whole different level of self, a whole different self-knowing, yeah? How much more powerful would that be with Buddha? 
right? So this is the point he's making here, is that it, even if you practice all of the teachings and you read through the Lotus Sutra like it's just another teaching and you're just rote habit forming your practice, without your dedication, without your absolute conviction, this is what's required to awaken that deep experience of Buddha-ness. Yeah? And Nichiren has given us all the tools to, to even, you could say, trick ourselves into making that happen by using this mandala and forcing our mind to focus on Buddhahood and listen to the chant of the law of Buddhahood. Dedicate ourselves to it. Namu Buddhahood. You ever wonder why sometimes that mandala, as you focus on it, you're really convinced, starts to not quite sit still? It's because your mind is shifting from this attachment of stuff to this much more dynamic, constant, fluid reality of moment to moment, 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 birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. Ah, I'm seeing it. I'm experiencing it. And the more you do that, the more your mind will learn to filter your experience through that knowing, through that experience, you're getting unglued from all those visceral emotional states that are constructed. They're not real. We experience them as real because we're immersed in them. Picture a fish forever living its life in water. When you pull it out of the water, it doesn't know what to do. Things get very shaky, but what if, if, the, if the fish stayed in that air environment, out of the water environment, just long enough to take a nice slow and could breathe the air? I know that's not our reality, but as an example, an analogy, what if after a few shaky moments that fish were to say, wow, this oxygen thing is amazing. How different would the rest of the world look to a fish who had always experienced it through water? Right? That's our quest to awaken that Buddha mind. Like I've talked about driving through cornfields, exiting the other side, everything becomes quiet clear, amazing. Yeah? Revealing the single path to Buddhahood in the Agama Sutras, the Lotus Sutra preaches in Chapter 2, Expedience, I expounded various Hinayana Sutras according to the capacities of all living beings. They are the entrance to the Mahayana teaching. That's a quote from the Lotus. So you see, our rhetoric is built on the words of Shakyamuni. I'm not inventing this. Nietzsche didn't invent this. He's just quoting the words of Shakyamuni and saying, you see? Revealing the single path to Buddhahood in the Flower Garland Sutra, the Lotus Sutra states in chapter 16, the lifespan of the Buddha, the, quote, the gods, men, and asuras in the world think that I, Shakyamuni Buddha, left the place of the Shakyas, sat at a place of enlightenment not from the, far from the city of Gaia, and attained Buddhahood. To tell the truth, however, it has been innumerable kalpa eons since I attained Buddhahood. I question that translation. We read it all the time, though. And even if that's sort of the way he said it, please understand it's but not me, Shakyamuni. It's this Buddha-ness. It's, it's not new. I didn't just discover it as something new. It's new to me, Shakyamuni. It's new to, new to me, Siddhartha Gautama. But Buddha isn't something I invented. 
It's the same rhetoric. I didn't invent Buddhahood. I, through tremendous determination to find the ultimate dignity of human life, to live it fully without these attachments, these things that get in our way that cause us fear, suffering, anxiety. It gets in the way of our seeing the amazing glory of being alive. And consequently, the universe, the life of which we are experiencing through this amazing thing called a mind. To not do that is a disparagement. It's a lessening. It's a samsaric trap. How can we release ourselves from it? How can I liberate my mind, my experience, my life from this, what, materialistic suffering? For what? Why? Why so nervous? That realization is as old as the universe. In the case of the Wisdom Sutra, the Lotus Sutra states 18 types of voidness in chapter 14, or emptiness, or non-attachment. Non Peaceful practices. The voidness which is expounded in the Wisdom Sutra is included in the Lotus Sutra. In the case of the Sutra of Meditation on the Buddha of Infinite Life, the Lotus Sutra preaches the doctrine of preaching the pure land of peace in chapter 23. Quote, anyone who hears this sutra and acts according to its teachings will be reborn in this pure land upon death. You will transform from this moment of the 3,000 realms shifting constantly in your mind, in your thought moment, and by practicing Myoho Renge Kyo, this teaching, you will go from that death to birth in Buddhahood. Death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, birth, moment to moment. You will invoke your enlightened nature. It happens that quickly in a single thought moment. That's what's meant by immediate and perfect. As for practicing virtuous deeds with distracted minds, the Lotus Sutra reveals, now you see what he's doing, I hope. And if not, let me just reiterate it. Nichiren is demonstrating in the, with the words of the Lotus Sutra that Shakyamuni has been teaching the same truth all along through all of these other sutras, these other teachings, the Hinayana, the Agama, the so on and so forth. He's labeling specific core concepts of other sutras. Although because they were taught to the comprehension context of the people he was talking to, they understood them provisionally. They didn't really grasp them. And Shakyamuni hadn't given them the perfect tool to invoke it. He was just telling them about it. But in the lotus, it congeals into the thing itself. As for practicing virtuous deeds with distracted minds, the Lotus Sutra reveals the single path by saying in chapter 2, expedients, quote, those who chanted just once, Namu Buddha, without concentration, in mind, have already attained the enlightenment of Buddhahood. Namu is critical. Those two syllables, those two characters, Namu. For all living beings, the Lotus Sutra says in chapter 3, a parable, this triple world is my property. In other words, everything is Buddha. Experience, Buddha, you have to understand, is a state of mind. It's an experience. 
It's not a thing. So everything in the universe perceivable, Buddha-able is contained within Buddhahood. That's what that means. All living beings therein are my children. All sentient and insentient, but all living beings are an experience of Buddha. For the non-Buddhist teachings and writings, the Lotus Sutra says in chapter 19, the merits of the teacher of the Dharma, quote, quote, when they expound the scriptures of non-Buddhist schools or give advice to the government or teach the way to earn a livelihood, they will be able to, in accord with the right teachings of the Buddha. As I was saying earlier, we make great efforts to become learned teachers of mathematics, of English writing, of, uh, of carpentry, right? Uh, all these things. This is our human. We're built this way. To teach one another, to learn from one another. It's always a relationship. Like the relationship of mind-body, mind-other, itaidoshin, all of it. So we know innately how to accomplish anything by focusing and concentrating and dedicating and being determined to, right? So why not apply that same innate ability to enlightenment? It's just another, although quite a supreme other. It's not a samsarically based endeavor. Although you could argue it is, because Buddhahood's only experienced here in this life, right? Passages that describe the revelation of a single path to Buddhahood in the Tushita heaven or of gods and men are too numerous to write them all down here. Those who have not learned the teachings of this Lotus Sutra do not read between the lines. Get the meaning. Encountering such passages as, quote, they will be reborn amongst men and gods in the Devadatta chapter, quote, anyone, so on and so forth, will be reborn in the Trayash Trima, Trimsa heaven or Tushita heaven in the encouragement of the universal sage Bodhisattva or quote anyone will be reborn in the pure land of peace in the previous life of the medicine king Bodhisattva they think that they must repeat the cycle of birth and death because they have not reached the irrevocable stage no matter how hard they may practice the Lotus Sutra in this defiled land or how excellent the Lotus Sutra may be. The cycle of birth and death. Birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. Escaping that cycle doesn't mean annihilation. Escaping that cycle means that repeating cycle of attachments. Change it with that next moment to enlightenment. Nothing goes away. It's just a perceptive shift. Such people believe that they have to wait until the time when Maitreya Bodhisattva will appear in this world. Five million six hundred seventy well, five billion six hundred seventy million thousand years from now, or that they will repeatedly be reborn as human beings or animals bearing limitless suffering. They may also say that the practice of the Lotus Sutra calls for the own power of the practicer and therefore is difficult to practice. Again, that, that rumor, that disgusting uh, tool used by those that would confuse and manipulate you, world of anger. 
make you think, ah, oh, the Lotus Sutra is just for special people who can do that. It's not for everyone. No. Buddha's whole goal, Shakyamuni's whole goal was for anyone to be able to accomplish this because it's already there. You just need to awaken it. These people are those who do not know the difference between the pre-Lotus Sutras and the Lotus Sutra. They just see it as just some more ritual, you know, samsaric behavior. They haven't committed to enlightenment. They are not only wandering blindly in their own stupidity and ignorance, but also closing the Buddha eye of all living beings. See, that's the worst part. They're not only choosing to be ignorant, but they're teaching that ignorance. So others from the get-go to them understand they'll never attain Buddhahood. How disgusting. That's so, nothing could be more opposite from the Shakyamuni's goal. Yeah. Wishing to be reborn in the Tushita heaven is encouraged by many Hinayana sutras. But here, when they talk about reborn, they are talking about a death, not moment to moment, but in actuality, and then going on to another place. That's religion. That's not Buddhism. It is also preached in some Mahayana sutras. Many Mahayana sutras encourage the rebirth in the land of the utmost bliss to the West. They are provisional sutras that are later merged into the one vehicle teaching in the Lotus Sutra. According to the teaching of the Lotus Sutra, both the Tushita Heaven and the Pure Land to the West are not separated. They're right here and now. They are our living experience. Both of them, as well as the worlds of humans and gods, are contained in the Buddha lands all over the universe. Right now, in this moment, this moment, in this moment, in this moment, we are living parts of the entire engine of existence, the universe. That doesn't begin and end with a lifespan of a species or a thing. It's a constant state of being. We need to enlighten ourselves to that state of being. Expounding the mutual possession of the Ten Realms doctrine, the Lotus Sutra reveals to, uh, I hate to keep using this word evil, please understand once again, this just means people getting in their own way, cutting themselves off from enlightenment. That's what that means. The Lotus Sutra reveals to those persons the the confound, you gotta, gotta think of a different word. I guess we could just use obstacle. Our obstacle to enlightenment of the ten realms, and at the same time informs that they are endowed with the five kinds of eyes human eyes, eyes of heaven, eyes of wisdom, eyes of Dharma, and our eyes of the Buddha eye. Again, this is a perceptual Buddhism is about the mind. And the intent, attitude and intent. Yeah? So there it is in very specific statements. Is that there are different kinds of eyes. Are there different kinds of eyes? We all have this function of this globe with its retina to perceive light, colors, that goes to our brain and our brain figures out imagery and catalogs it and our mind decides about that. So the mind has five different types of seeing. Not different kinds of eye, but different kinds of visual consciousness. And if you see through your eyes as a predator, the world looks a certain way, right? Uh, what's that common saying I hear all the time? If you think everything is a nail, how can you help but be a hammer? Right? But if you change your perception and you have the eye of enlightenment, of awe, 
and compassion and you perceive the nature down to the subatomic level of everything, that everything is just energy in motion as well as yourself. And you perceive everything with that equanimity. They're just manifesting in different forms. Forms are wonderful to play with, to associate, to do things with. But they aren't things. They're just operands like the plus or minus or symbols we use in math. Plus isn't A, B, C, or X. Plus is plusness. And it's acted or projected on specific quantities. That's what everything is. It's a quantity. It's a manifestation of potential. And we're all moving together. With that kind of perception, the other perceptions don't go away, but they're modified by that kind of perception, like the fish suddenly being able to breathe air. Understands the aquarium completely differently. Hmm? The aquarium isn't its world anymore. It's a container. It has a very parametized world within it and now the fish can see that but being in it could not see that this is done in an effort to save even the most wicked amongst those with the greatest difficulty to perceive Buddha, Buddha-ness. It's, it's very inclusive. No matter where you come from, what you misunderstand, how you've been mistrained and, and uh, whatever. No matter how far away you are or you think you are from your Buddhahood, the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment give you immediate access to Buddhahood. The 10 realms do that. Yeah. Regarding women, there's another biggie. It can be said that all of the realms are inhabited by women because according to the doctrine of the mutual possession of the ten realms, women are included in the ten realms. This is very revolutionary. Hell, we're still struggling with that, aren't we, ladies? Think of this man 3,000 years ago is saying, no, women can be Buddhas. <gasps> what? <laughs> Thus, the enlightenment of women is a reality. Because you're really no different than men. And I'm not talking about sex. Don't let your mind go. We're, we're well above that animality if you want to go to that it, there's very little difference in our genitals really if you think about it there's not much that separates us therefore those who believe in the lotus sutra and seek buddhahood cannot be led down to the nine realms of delusion by force of karma what an important sentence that is What's key in that sentence? Studying the Lotus Sutra and seek Buddhahood. It's always the key statement. Nietzsche and harps on this all the time. If you practice Lotus Sutra Buddhism with a single-mindedly to meet Buddha, to experience Buddha, with that determination... Nothing will get in your way. You will invoke it immediately. The force of karma, the Ichin and Sanzen, the, the processes of energy that brought you to this formation as a human in this time and space to emerge this mind, all of that cannot prevent you from 
turning the light on the, in the attic. Buddhahood. It's instantaneous because it's always there. It's just waiting for you to turn the light on. Invoke it. Honen Shonen may already know this. Now he's going to talk about teachers of his era in Japan. Although he practiced the single-minded chanting of the name of Buddha of infinite life, Amida Buddha, he wrote the collection of passages on the Nembutsu in which he at times omitted the lotus. In the Great Sun Buddha Sutras, and other sutras from the list of miscellaneous and difficult to practice teachings to be discarded. If he was so concerned about getting rid of these other teachings, why didn't he consistently mention all of them? Please take a careful look at the collection of passages on the Nembutsu for details. The essential collection concerning rebirth in the pure land, which Eshin wrote, too omits the Lotus Sutra. You just don't talk about it at all because it is the truth of self-practice. It is the ultimate teaching of Shakyamuni. And so if they're going to build some alternate Buddhism to their needs, to their ego, for their purposes, they can't do too much deconstruction of the Lotus because it's just going to blow their arguments about, apart all the time. So they just kind of sidestep it. Yeah. Yeah. Not unusual, still done today, right? It does not matter to me, Nichiren, if Honen, Shonen, and Eshin both <clears throat> consider the Lotus Sutra as a miscellaneous or difficult to practice way for the people in the latter age of degeneration. For such a view is against the teachings and remonstrates, te preached, uh, mem remonstrates, ah, remonstrances, remonstrances, arguments preached by the Buddha during his lifetime. In other words, they obviously didn't read the text or learn the sermons and runs counter to the words of various Buddhas residing in the worlds throughout the universe in past, present, and future. So in other words, it's a clever way of saying, if you're not going to believe Shakyamuni Buddha, dude, it's his teaching. But if you're not going to respect Shakyamuni Buddha's words, then certainly if you're following Amida Buddha, understand that those Buddhas are inventions of Shakyamuni Buddha. So they're still his words, but okay. So even Amida Buddha doesn't buy into your argument. And he's an emanation of an imaginary personage of Shakyamuni's. Nowhere in the scholarship of Buddhism do Eshin and Honen have an argument that stands? It's constantly falling apart. <sighs> Yet Honen and Eshin did not have such a view. However, later people wrote, quote, the Lotus Sutra is difficult to practice. Obviously influenced by them, yeah? The Sutra is admirable but not suited to the inferior capacity of the people in the latter age of degeneration, which is also a counter statement to Shakyamuni. As Shakyamuni was saying that the people of the latter age of degeneration, you and me, would be superior in capacity and therefore have to have a more direct line to invoke Buddhahood. We'd be admired in distraction that's the age of degeneration, distractions and manipulations. We're, we live and swim in a soup of misinformation in our day. Nothing like the, humanity has never experienced before. And so where to invoke and to practice a teaching that would allow us to enlighten our minds, if it takes any amount of time, uh, people will fall away. That's too much work. We, with all the distractions we experience, we need something immediate. Let's go. Namo myo renge kyo. Hard to think of anything more concise than that.
It is not too late to understand the Lotus Sutra after you are reborn in the pure land of the Buddha of infinite life, though you may be committing the sin of slandering the true Dharma. So even if you've been chanting Amida Buddha, Amida Buddha for years, it's not too late. I, Nichiren, do not consider such views to be right. Or do you think my opinion is wrong? Please discuss this with wise men, to be sure. So, don't think we know who exactly he wrote this to. But we know it's an early attempt of Nichiren's scholarship to influence those who would be or were his students, right? Trying to see if there's any reference to a date here. I'm sure there are somewhere, but in this publication I don't see. And usually there's quite a, an explicit date. I think I saw somewhere, though, that this was in 54, 1254. But I don't know now. Oh, here it is. How did I miss that? On the 14th day, second month, in the second year of the Shoka era, 1258. So still kind of in the middle of Nichiren's teaching life. So obviously this was a teaching probably meant for a sangha, a group of students, to dive into and discuss because this question of the breadth of teachings of Shakyamuni is probably quite prevalent as you know the, this was a time when there were several other schools in, in Japanese Buddhism that were vying for allegiance from people so how could the Lotus Sutra which they all talked about in some form disparagingly or not how could the Lotus Sutra itself be such a treasure, such the the actual goal of Buddhist uh, Buddhism, and yet have such seeming opponents to it? So Nitrin standing up and saying, "Just read the freaking thing, <laughs> read the scholarship of Buddhism, not just the Lotus, but all of them. They'll all show you. Once you see the Lotus Sutra, you'll understand what all of these others are babbling about. It's very, very clear. And so he's putting it to the Sangha, to the, these groups of students to, to get together to discuss this. What do you think? This is the way I see it, right? How do you see it? All right, well, so we've we've ended that go show. Not sure which one I will do next, or maybe I'll just do a free form. Give me some suggestions, uh, especially if something along the last few videos has piqued your interest about, and I'll do a deeper dive into it. Uh, right, I want to address your concerns. I like talking about uh, Nietzsche's scholarship. It's always amazing and clear. Um, we've talked about a lot of different sutras on this channel. Certainly there are no more videos. I mean, out of well over 600 videos on this channel, uh, more than half of them are Gosho. So yeah, we talk about Nichiren's doctrine a lot, but it's all about the Lotus Sutra and Namo Myo Rengekyo, always. But, you know, I've, I've put out videos on, you know, how do I change, how, how do I, what should be in my head as I chant? What, what is the Daimoku? How does that work? Blah, 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 blah. These are constant day-to-day -day questions we have about our practice. And I like talking about those things. It brings us back to the teaching. But I don't want you to feel like this, that, that, I, that this channel or this practice is pedantic. This is exactly what Nitrin would rail against. Don't let it become just a, a force of habit. Right? Do it with dignity, with purpose. 
Namum Yod and Gekyo. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support. Please like, subscribe. Subscribing is very important. Share if you have the opportunity. Hell, have listening parties and, and, and talk amongst yourselves. If you have that opportunity, make a little sangha with a good friend. It doesn't have to be a meeting place and all formal and everything. just chant. Get together and chant. Try to avoid the foibles of uh, technology. We need human to human interaction. And I know that may sound hypocritical me on YouTube here, but I'm in an isolated area. And I occasionally get visitors that can come here, and I always think that's a precious opportunity. But this channel is for study. It's for us to feel inspired, find insight. This is why I don't focus too much about the chanting online. I just had a little glitch. I'm moving too much. That seems to be too much for this computer. One day I'll be able to afford a proper desktop computer to do these videos. I apologize for the little glitches uh, we sometimes experience. I should wrap it up so that we minimize that. But at any rate, keep your practice strong. That's what this is about. Ask questions in the comments. If some of you can get together comments will probably come from that let me know what those are and let's keep growing the sangha it keeps expanding and i'm so appreciative thank you for your support thank you on patreon for my patrons uh through paypal.me slash sifu sylvain any ways that you can help us to create quality and dependability in these podcasts you're amazing. Thank you, my Bodhisattva friends. I respect and have great, deep appreciation for all of you. Take care of yourself, be kind, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.